This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 484. I don't need to know what your Enneagram number is. I need to know why your emails are so long. Right? <laughs> right? I, don't, I don't need to know what your disk letter is. I need to know how you prefer to receive feedback. Why are some teams more motivated, innovative, and successful than others? Why do some groups of talented people fall short against lesser teams? And how do you go about building a high-performing team? Hi, I'm Jeff Brown, and this is the Read to Lead podcast, the podcast dedicated to your personal and professional growth. If you want to achieve true success in business and in life, I believe that an intentional and consistent reading habit is a key part of that journey. In nearly every episode, I invite an author to come in and share with us about their book, and their unique insights on a number of different topics. Today's guest, who's been here twice before, is author David Burkus. His new book is called Best Team Ever, The Surprising Science of High-Performing Teams. I'll be asking David to share about common understanding, psychological safety, and what he calls pro-social purpose, how building empathy on a team allows members to raise their level of collective intelligence, the idea that trust is more about reciprocity than it is about being earned or given, and much more. If you haven't yet joined us in the Read to Lead community by becoming a Read to Lead Plus member, then what the heck are you waiting for? Your membership gets you access to a monthly Ask Me Anything or AMA with yours truly, access to a monthly guest expert training led by former guests of this very show, monthly themed challenges, networking opportunities, and the chance to be spotlighted within the community. All that for just nine bucks a month. And you can even try it free for two weeks to see if it's indeed right for you. So take advantage of that two week free trial right now. And then after that, all that I just mentioned is just nine bucks a month. Oh, I even forgot this a free business book summary every single week as well. Try it two weeks free, then nine bucks a month. Get all the details at jeffbrown.me. David Burkus is a sought-after international speaker and best-selling author. Since 2017, he's been ranked multiple times as one of the world's top business thought leaders. His insights on leadership and teamwork have been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, USA Today, Fast Company, The Financial Times, Bloomberg, Business Week, CNN, the BBC, NPR, and CBS This Morning. A former business school professor, he now works with leaders from organizations across all industries, including PepsiCo, Fidelity, Adobe, and NASA. His new book is called Best Team Ever, The Surprising Science of High-Performing Teams. Well, David, I'm excited to have you back on the show. Uh, welcome officially to the Read to Lead podcast for what I think is the third time. Is that right? I think so. I think so. You know, I could make a third time's a charm joke, et cetera. But listen, just thank you for, for having me back. I, I assume the first two went pretty decently if, if we earned a third. So I'm excited. Thanks for having me back. This is book five. So we're, we're shooting three out of five. That's not too bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, in fairness, I don't know that Read Delete existed when book one came out. Oh, there you go. There right. You go. <laughs> and then book four was COVID book. It was such a blur. I just needed to get it out. Well, I love uh, well-researched books, and this is certainly one. And, and I'm curious, as you combed through the research that informed the book, what did it tell you about team culture versus individual team members? What, what were the, yeah. the eye-opening things? You know, there's a, there's a line in the book, right in the intro that we use, or ta- where, where I say, talent doesn't make the team, the team makes the talent, right? And so I think that's kind of speaks right to your question about team culture versus individual team members. I Now, don't get me wrong. All, th- all other things being equal, I'd still prefer talented team members. I'm not saying if you just hire totally incompetent people with no skills, <laughs> you, you, it'll all work out. But what I mean, and what I've come to realize in, in writing this book, I sort of describe it this way now. Talent is latent performance. It's not actually performance, right? It has to do something in order to mm-hmm. turn into performance. It's a bit like gasoline, for example, right? Gasoline is latent energy. You have to put it into an engine. You have to put it into some mechanical device. You have to explode it and then use pistons to turn it into forward motion or, or whatever you do, right? And I think talent's relationship to teams is the same way. Individuals with talent, yeah, there's some you know solopreneurs out there who do great, but they still are usually embedded in a network of people helping them. It's the people around you, the other people working on the project that help you turn talent into performance. And you see this in a myriad of different studies 
studies. Um, the best one I've seen conducted suggests about 60% of the results that an individual is able to achieve are actually the result of the company that they're uh, on, the team that they're on, the resources they have access to. In other words, things external to their talent. And so that's why I say talent doesn't make the team. The team makes the talent. And, and we see the inverse of this all the time, by the way. There's mm-hmm. no shortage of examples of teams, let's say sports teams, for example, hiring out, uh, paying top dollar for somebody with a track record of success. They join that new team and the whole thing falls apart, right? It happens in, in every sport. It happens in business. Mm-hmm. It happens with CEO acquisitions, uh, you know, when they're hired all of the time. And it happens so often, it, it makes me wonder why it still surprises us. But at least the research is not surprising. The research is pretty clear. The talent doesn't make the team. The team makes the talent. In in interviews, I've been asked several times with any level of success you've had, Jeff, what do you uh, mostly attribute it to? Like if you you could pinpoint one thing, and my answer often revolves around, as a solopreneur, the the mastermind groups I'm a part of, the the people that I surround myself with. So yeah, that, that, that really connects with me. Because as I look at, again, any success I've had, I know that if it weren't for those people spurring me on and convincing me to do things that that I wouldn't have maybe the courage to try without their encouragement, then I then I wouldn't enjoy the success that I do. Yeah, yeah, and even the introductions, the the connections, the the vendors, the subcontractors you might hire as part of all of your projects. Like we think of team in a work context solely as people who all work for the same company, but we don't live in that world anymore, right? The team right. is any group of people working together towards a project, whether they get the same paycheck or not. Yeah, good point. The book is laid out very well. Not that you need me to tell you that, but uh, three parts, two chapters to each part. And, and I like to, as you know, unpack books very methodically. And, and I'd like to do that with yours. And I want you to lay the groundwork for us for the three uh, interconnected elements that make up the structure of the book before we dive into each of those elements. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it's a bit of a trick, right? Because there's three, but there's actually six, but people remember threes. So, so we went for threes and actually, you know, the subtitle of the book is the the surprising science. And what's surprising is usually the pair of twos. And, and here's what I mean. So the big three elements you look at, uh, there's about 40 years of research and team culture and every researcher uses different terminologies and what have you, but you can kind of synthesize all of the research in three elements of the culture, common understanding, psychological safety, and what I call pro-social purpose, which is different than just normal purpose or having a mission statement, et cetera. And we'll unpack all of that. Mm -hmm. Common understanding kind of has two elements to it, what we call clarity and empathy in the book. And the reason it has those two elements is that we think, okay, people need role clarity. Teams need to know what to do. You need to keep track of, you know, this is project management 101. You need to be able to keep track of goals and deadlines and who's working on what and what have you. And yeah, you totally need that. But teams also need to have clarity of person, which I'm calling empathy here. You need to understand the people you're working with, their work preferences, their personalities, what what have you, right? So common understanding is really kind of those two elements. Psychological safety, a lot of people use psychological safety interchangeably with trust, but it's not just trust. It's not just whether or not a team trusts each other. That's important, but it's also how they behave because how they behave determines whether or not they continue to trust each other, especially how they behave when disagreements happen and what have you. We call that respect. So psychological safety, those two elements then are trust and respect. And then the last one, pro-social purpose, like I said, this isn't just meaning. This isn't just knowing that you make a contribution to work that matters. It really means that you can see who specifically is impacted by your work. So we split that down into meaning and impact. And so we can unpack each one, one by one. We can uh, each of the three or each of the six, how, however you want to play it. Yeah, I'd like to dig into each of the six if we can and, and, and start with clarity since that's, the, that's chapter one and sort of related to that, how to build clarity on a team. But then also, what do you say to someone who says or suggests that, well, the more clarity you have, the less your team needs to communicate? Yeah. Well, I mean, a, a couple things there, but we'll, we'll touch on that. So yeah. So clarity here is really about how well team members know what's expected of them. They know what's expected of other people. Sometimes you hear clarity called dependability or reliability, right? Because you also trust and, and rely on your teammates for doing what they're doing. I think more importantly, especially in a hybrid work world or in, in a knowledge work team, having clarity on who's going to do what by when matters tremendously too. I mean, I don't know how many times in your professional life have you been waiting to move forward on a project until you get a deliverable from somebody else on your team who didn't 
know that you're waiting on it. <laughs> and so it's not a priority for them. And so there's a bottleneck there, right? And that's what clarity really speaks to, right? Who's doing what? Who's doing what by when? How does it fit into the larger larger purpose? And then if you've got long timelines, you know, a year plus, maybe even clarity around what our milestones are in, in the short term. Mm-hmm. Now, to your point, ironically about that would mean they'd communicate or they'd collaborate less. We actually don't see that in, in teams that don't have a lot of clarity built from the very beginning. We see them spend a disproportionate proportion amount of time jockeying for position, fighting for who's leader, who's doing what. Since roles aren't clearly defined, people spend too much time fighting over preferential roles and not enough time working. Believe it or not, especially in a, in a hybrid or a virtual work environment, the highest performing teams usually have what we call bursty communication. They do come together, they communicate, they communicate quickly, they sync up around where are we, what are we focused on, how can we help each other, and then they go their separate ways. Now, obviously, some teams have to work in concert. My wife is a physician. There's a whole team of people that she works with when she treats a patient. But I mean, in knowledge work, an office-based setting, the best teams aren't in constant communication. They're not working in an open office where all six of them are sitting around the same desk. They're syncing up in a conference room once or twice a week and then giving long periods of uninterrupted time to do that deep work. So whoever pushes back on clarity to say they won't communicate all that much, they have a point. It's just not the point they think they're making. (laughs) I like that answer. A friend of mine the other day posted on Facebook uh, looking for a one word description of leadership. And my answer immediately, I came to the word empathy. And that's that's the focus of, of chapter two in your book. How does how does building empathy on a team allow members to raise their level of, of what you call collective intelligence? Yeah. So, so this is surprise number one, right? In the surprising science of high performing teams that just as important of having clear roles and defined tasks is having clarity of person, of understanding the differences in, you know, sometimes this is called personality, but truthfully, like, I don't need to know what your Enneagram number is. I need to know why your emails are so long, right? <laughs> right? I don't, I don't need to know what your disc letter is. I need to know how you prefer to receive feedback. Right. And, th- and that's why I think I love your idea that leadership is, is empathy. You need to have that kind of individual understanding on a team. It's the same way. You need to understand those differences and commonalities so that you know how to keep somebody updated, how to give them feedback, how to disagree and keep respect. We'll talk about that a lot in the second pillar. You, you mm-hmm. kind of need to know all of that. Even truthfully, a lot of times you just need to know the context people are working in. Right, because that changes what you expect from them in terms of responsiveness and what have you. And if you do that, then you're able to achieve what um, to researchers like Anita Williams Woolley would call collective intelligence, which is something not every team achieves. Most teams are kind of the average of the talent or the performance or the intelligence mm-hmm. on their team. But some teams that engage in conversational turn taking or what's sometimes called social sensitivity, they understand each other. They understand those little nonverbals that suggest that you have something to share, but you're not willing to come out and say it yet because you're not the extrovert in the room. As you start to get all those things, you get more information. So you make better decisions because you're considering more options. You make decisions people have an easier time committing to because they have ownership over it, because they spoke to it, et cetera. And all of that flows out of this first goal of achieving empathy, not Maybe not the way we talk about empathy in terms of friendship. You know, people always distinguish sympathy is when I feel bad for you. Empathy is when I feel what you feel. Mm -hmm. I think in a work context, I kind of define empathy as I can see the world as Jeff sees it, right? I understand Mm -hmm. Jeff's personality, his preferences, his strengths and weaknesses so well that when we're faced in a situation, yes, I see the situation from my perspective, but I know Jeff so well, I can see it from his perspective as well. And that helps us achieve that collective intelligence. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, trust and respect. Those are the two parts of pillar number two, the, the psychological safety pillar uh, that David writes about. We hear often that, that, that trust is, is given or earned, but you say it's reciprocated, actually, that, that trust <laughs> begets trust, essentially. How so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we will talk about either people giving us their trust or, or trust is earned over time and what have you. And that's not not true, but I think it doesn't express what's the beautifulness of the human condition of what's actually going on as people trust each other. So we know this on a, on a biochemical level. We can see this trust fundamentally when you feel trusted, when you feel connected to someone else, when you are feeling like you can be vulnerable and safe around that person, what you're actually feeling is the hormone oxytocin in your bloodstream and in your brain. 
right? Trust is a chemical, if you will. And what we know from putting people in labs and doing all sorts of fun structured studies is that, it, Jeff, if I'm vulnerable with you, I admit a failure or I take a risk and, and say, here's how I see things differently. And I, I set myself up potentially for criticism, for sharing a crazy idea but you respond respectfully, what happens is the level of oxytocin in my bloodstream spikes and it does in yours. And over time, that means we trust more. By the way, if you want to get really nerdy, oxytocin is also kind of called the love chemical or the love hormone sometimes because children bond with their parents and, and you know partners bond with each other. And what they're really feeling in those moments is an increase in oxytocin. Work teams, pl platonic teams work the exact same way, right? Mm -hmm. It's that increase in oxytocin. It's a reciprocal process. And, and that's why I say this. This isn't just about building trust on a team. You have to teach people to respond to those vulnerable moments with respect so that that mm -hmm. cycle of oxytocin and production continues. You can either have a, a virtuous cycle or a vicious cycle. You decide, right? But it's not enough to just build trust on a team. You also have to be teaching the team how to respond to disagreements respectively, how to actively listen to each other so that respect keeps that cycle going. Otherwise, and I'm sure this has happened to you at some point in your career, you don't have to talk specifically about it, <laughs> but that time you got vulnerable with somebody, you admitted a failure and they took advantage of it, or you shared a crazy idea and you immediately got shot down. You didn't trust that person as much anymore, right? Your oxytocin plummeted. Right. And, and you knew, oh, I need to be, I need to be careful around that person. I need to be cautious around that person. Now that's the opposite of what we want on a team. Yeah. I, I have a very specific <laughs> situation in mind that I'm not going to go into detail about, but uh, oh, I, I think if you've had, if you've been in the workforce for more than a year, you've got a very specific <laughs> incident in mind. Yeah. I will say one of the things I loved about the last traditional job that I had was uh, one of the things I remember we did early on, we, was we read five dysfunctions of a team by Pat Lynch. Mm. You know, Mm -hmm. And uh, I really came to understand how things like lack of trust that he talks mm -hmm. about and, and fear of conflict was, I think, another one of the five dysfunctions. And so on the team that I, that I worked on, because we had trust, as you talked about, uh, when conflict happened, as long as respect was maintained, conflict was okay. Conflict was actually encouraged. Yeah. And, and that's actually... You know, my shortcut when I'm working one on one with leaders or when I'm in a leadership training and, and trying to gauge at a psychological safety problem, my mm -hmm. shortcut is I'll directly ask the leader, hey, when was the last time somebody disagreed with you publicly? Right. Mm -hmm. And if it's six months ago, we have a problem. It's usually not, but it's, you know, OK, three weeks ago. Great. Tell me about it. How mm -hmm. did it go? Right. Like I'm looking again, like I said, if you don't, if you can't remember, that's a huge problem. Right? Right, right. But even if you can, I'm looking to go, okay, how did you respond? How did they respond? What happened? Because that, that is when true, what we might call trust or true psychological safety is built is in those moments and how people respond. You can do team building activities. You want, you can go do trust falls. You can go hire some outdoor ropes course to take your team out and everybody feels good. You can do all of that stuff. But until that conflict actually happens, you mm -hmm. don't know if all you've built is actually trust or just affinity. I like these people. Yeah, but do you trust them? Mm -hmm. You don't know that until you've had those conflict moments and you've seen people respond to those trusting conflict disagreement moments with respect. I don't agree with you, but I hear you, right? That's what makes all the difference in the world on a team. Such a good point. Yeah, I've done the trust falls and the rope courses too <laughs> in past places I've worked. The last section unpacks meaning and impact. Talk, if you would, about why meaning is so important and, and what are some ways that, that leaders can help foster meaning on a team? Yeah, yeah. So, so that third element, right? I call it pro social purpose because we're leveraging a couple different things here. If you, I'll get nerdy for a second just because I, I'm a psychologist by training. <laughs> and what we're really referring to here in pro-social purpose is what's sometimes called a, a sense of pro-social motivation and also task significance. Those are fancy terms for those people who really like to run a Google Scholar search after they listen to podcasts. But the <laughs> summary of those two terms is that people want to make a contribution toward work that positively benefits other people. Mm -hmm. So the first element, meaning, is about that making a contribution. Psychology literature, we call that task significance. People want to know that their job matters, right? That, that their job is, is actually contributing to the organization, is actually seen as important. You know, there's a lot of talk of these sort of what are sometimes called BS jobs. I, I don't believe it, right? At this mm -hmm. point, we've had 40 years of uh, binge and purge cycles of layoffs. At this point, if your job didn't matter to your company, uh, it would have been outsourced probably in the 1990s, mm. right? So the difference is showing people that their work actually matters, that if they didn't show up, here's what the impact would be. We need you. You're part of a team that is making that contribution. And we derive a sense of meaning from that, right? Mm. Um, 
And so for, as a leader, I mean, there's a couple of different ways we could do this. I think, I think probably the, the biggest one, the, the one, I, I won't say biggest, the most fun one I like to do is a thought experiment. I call the, it's a wonderful life test. You remember it's a wonderful life, the movie, oh, yeah. it's a wonderful life, oh, right? Right. <laughs> uh, Christmas classic, even though it was actually a box office flop, mm-hmm. um, fun, fun fact, it was a total flop at the box office. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't until it went into the public domain and TV stations realized they could show it without paying anyone a royalty. Mm-hmm. And they started showing it every Christmas and it became a Christmas classic because local TV stations didn't want to pay anyone any money. But anyway, in the movie, you got George, right? And George Bailey wants to commit suicide because he feels like his life has no meaning, right? Mm-hmm. That it's not important, that it's too hard, et cetera. And then an angel comes to him, Clarence, worst name for an angel <laughs> ever, right? You've got, you've got Michael and Gabriel and Clarence. It's just, it's terrible. But anyway, Clarence, Clarence shows him what the world would be like if he didn't exist, shows him what the impact on the community would be if his, if he was absent. And so I don't want to get morbid with teams, but sometimes running a thought experiment and showing people the impact of their absence shows them what the true meaning of their presence is. Right. And by the way, the movie, obviously you all know, ends. Clarence, Clarence, I want to live again, et cetera. Something about a bell ringing, right. The whole thing uh, that might actually be a different movie now that I'm thinking about it, but whatever um, <laughs> the idea here, with teams is to run that thought experiment. Maybe not morbid, right? But like, let's just say we all disappeared tomorrow, right? We were all on a cruise ship together, a three-hour tour, and then we ended up being stranded on Gilligan's Island for, for years. What would that impact be? How would that impact other people in the organization? Maybe our maybe it's our clients. A lot of times it's not. What would that impact be? And then if you see what would happen if you got, let's say, Thanos and snapped away immediately, what that impact would be, that lets you know who is served by that work that you're doing and what your contribution is, right? Mm-hmm. So that helps you kind of grow that sense of meaning. A lot of times after we do this, by the way, we'll come up with like a rallying cry for the team. Now that we know who we support, what's our sort of corny, weird, but funny phrase that we can use to remind people about what we do. Like I was working with a legal team about a, a couple months ago and they, they, their rallying cry and their symbol is that meme from Braveheart where they say, hold, hold, hold. And then the, <laughs> because that's what legal yeah. does, right? They hold the <laughs> line. They, they protect the organization. And so now they know what their contribution is, even though some people see them as redundant or back office or support role or whatever. No, their, their work is really, really important. And now they know that. I love some of the examples you shared and stories you shared of, of making impact or bringing impact, keeping impact front and center. Because as you said, it's, it's people want to know more than just that they're working for an organization that makes an impact. They want to know that they and their teams are mm-hmm. making an impact. Yeah. Yeah. And, and here is where I think with, with respect to someone who really got this purpose conversation going, here's where I think a lot of leaders stumble because they just talk about why. And, and why is great? Why is mission statement? Why is organizational purpose what we're about? And that's great. But what most people do to judge their impact is actually look for who. Mm. It's kind of why the It's a Wonderful Life test works as well, right? Is we were designed as humans. We're social creatures. We were designed to judge our impact based on who we see is impacted by our work. That's a specific person. That's a specific story. That's not a mission statement about disrupting our industry or, or whatever, mm. right? And I think keeping that top of mind. So not only do I know that my contribution matters, meaning, but I know that it positively impacts a specific person or group of people. That's that's the other thing that gets. And by the way, you see in the research literature, this is often referred to as pro-social motivation, which is itself a motivator, an individual motivator to work harder. Mm -hmm. But you actually see an increase in what are called organizational citizenship behaviors, which is a fancy org psychology term for teamwork, right? It basically means those moments where I put we over me are moments where I'm engaged in organizational citizenship behaviors. And when people know their work serves a specific person or group of people, they're more likely to engage in those behaviors. My favorite, you talked about stories. My favorite example of this is what happened in 2014 to about 2017 at at KPMG, the accounting firm, right? Um, They're one of the big four auditing and and tax accounting firms out there. And I mean, it's accounting, Jeff, it's boring, right? I mean, apologies to any accountants who actually (laughs) listen to this, but even you'd probably agree, right? Particularly auditing, right? The job of an auditor is to sit in the office or remotely uh, of a client company, not even your own company, (laughs) to sit in someone else's office, someone who doesn't want you to be there and to check their work. You're essentially grading their paper, Mm, right? mm. And whenever you have questions of the clients that you serve, they don't want to answer them because they're threatened by your very presence because it suggests that maybe they're not doing... 
that's a hard job to drive impact and meaning from. And so it's no surprise that they were struggling with engagement and, and what have you. And they they launched this amazing kind of two-part strategy to get people feeling more of their impact. The first was, uh, let's call it the why, right? The first was the t- bigger level, corporate level about how KPMG made an impact. It was called uh, the We Shape History campaign. And it collected all of these stories of times where KPMG as a firm had been engaged in historical moments. Like they certified the election of Nelson Mandela in 1992. They were involved in auditing the, the conflicting financial statements during the Iran hostage crisis in the 1980s, right? They helped with the 9-11 cleanup and the logistics and the contracting and the insurance contracts and all of that sort of stuff, right? So all of these pivotal moments in history, they're there to provide aid and support. And that's great. Move the needle a little bit. But what they did next was really, really brilliant because it went from why to who. What mm-hmm. they did next was they launched this thing they called the 10,000 Stories Challenge. They asked their 32, 35,000 employees or so to tell uh, about how you specifically shape history. And actually, the We Shape History campaign had these like posters that they would hang up at the offices that the auditors were never at because they were at the client office. But they had all these posters that they would circulate telling the story of 1992 election or Iran hostage crisis, et cetera. They actually created an app where as you wrote your own individual answer to the question, what do you do at KPMG? How do you make an impact? You could design your own posters with your own answer. Mm. Right. And so that was your story. What do you do here? Well, I restore neighborhoods because I audit community development programs. Or one of the one of the, the best ones I saw was I help farmers grow because my clients are farm uh, banks, our agricultural banks, the farm credit system that keeps family farms in business. Right. Think about the level of thinking you have to do about your impact to get to that stage. Right. right. Now, I, I cite this story. Their plan was to run it for a year and, and hopefully collect 10,000 stories. Within six months, they got 42,000 stories, Wow! which means some people did the assignment twice. <laughs> um, and I was a business school professor. That's exactly like any accounting student I ever had, right? Doing the assignment <laughs> twice. <laughs> so, the, the thing I think is amazing, though, is when they did their engagement survey the year later, they snuck a question in there about how well your manager or, in other words, your team talked about purpose. So they were able to kind of tease out the data between teams that took this seriously and wrote their own who and teams that didn't. And what they found was a crazy difference. Sometimes it was a doubling of the number of people who answered, I feel that the work that I do is important, right? Or I'm proud to work at KPMG. My favorite is that only 25% of people who were in groups that didn't talk about purpose answered affirmatively to the question, I rarely think about looking for a new job. In other words, Mm -hmm. 75% of people admitted on the engagement survey that they regularly think about looking for a new job (laughs) if they were in the purposeless condition. Mm. In the purpose condition, it was close to 80% that said, I rarely think about looking for a new job. I'm happy here. I make an impact here. I'm staying here, right? If you think about it, that's a massive difference just from not bonuses, not perks, not pay increases, just by talking about how your work matters and who it matters to. Mm. It's powerful, powerful. And I, the story is really bringing it home. And I love that you, and you, as a good writer, you begin each chapter with a story that really draws the reader in and helps drive the points to come home effortlessly. So kudos to you on that. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell I like telling the stories about purpose the most, by the way? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've, we've dipped our toe in the water of each chapter just a little bit. Um, anything we've not talked about, though, that you want to make sure we, we walk away with before I move on to a couple of questions not about the book? Yeah. I mean, I think so. we probably got everybody really confused, didn't we? Because we've got this in the, in the <laughs> book that we outlined, this triangle has three sides and each side has two sub sides. And you're trying to like, remember, if you grab the book, it'll all be clear, by the way, just to plug there. <laughs> but uh, the way I think about it is this. If you want to summarize everything we talked about in the last like 30 minutes. It's this, right? People want to do work that matters and they want to work for leaders who tell them they matter, right? So everything we talked about on purpose is people want to do work that matters. And the common understanding, the clarity and empathy, the psychological safety, all of that are ways that leaders show to their team that they matter. So if you're listening to this, like, where do I start? It's in one of those two categories. Either you start by helping your team feel like their work matters more, or you start by increasing the ways you're letting your team know that they matter to you more, Mm. right? Mm. Um, Those are one of those. Don't get 
bogged down by threes and twos and triangles and what just one of those two is where you should start. Mm, That's great advice. As an author and and one who uh, does a fair amount of research for the books that you write, uh, I know you read a lot of books. What would you say since we last spoke are the books that have come along that really impacted you? Yeah. So now I I, I should have listened to our old episodes because now I don't remember what I said and I've run the risk (laughs) of saying... um, I would say in a, in, a, in a business context, I can tell you the author. Let me start there. More so than anyone else, Roger Martin is probably the, the kind of business thinker, public intellectual who shaped my thinking the most. Okay. Um, I probably cited Roger's book, The Opposable Mind, in one of the two interviews we did last time, which is all about how good leaders are able to hold opposing thoughts in their mind and make them work. You know, I used to teach business school in strategy. We would always talk about every strategy is either low cost or differentiation. And yet there are companies like Target that get out there and manage to do both, right? And so that's kind of Roger's point is that these great leaders create whole new markets, whole new strategic opportunities by not accepting the same short changes that other people do, the same uh, either ors that other people do. Roger has a myriad of other books. His his book with AJ Laffley on strategy is one of my favorites as well. That's called Playing to Win. Um, and then even he, he has this book uh, called Fixing the Game that's all about capitalism and its role in society and what have you that is that is fantastic too. So I'm sorry, I wish I, I, wish I could give you one book of like, if you just read this, mm. right, in a, in a business context. Of course, if you want to go full life, et cetera, we could talk about the Bible and what have you, but if it appears <laughs> business context, yeah. um, it'd probably be a, pretty much anything written by Roger Martin. Yeah. And in fact, I was just checking as you were talking, you did indeed mention his book, <laughs> the, the Opposable Mind, last time yeah. we talked. It was that impactful. And you mentioned Creating Great Choices, which he co-wrote, uh, I believe, yeah. with Jennifer Real, is it? Yeah. Yep. Jennifer Real, which is, which is, she's an amazing woman. I had a chance to meet her a couple of times when I was at Rotman doing, doing different stuff. That's really kind of the follow-up book is like, you read the opposable mind and you go, okay, great. I recognize that leaders think this way. How do I think that way? Well, creating great choices is, is all about that. So yeah, I mean that one, um, I guess if I had to shy away from Roger Martin, Ed Catmull's Creativity Inc. is probably the best leadership memoir. Love that book. That I've read in a long time. I'm also, you know, in the book, I talk about Alan Mulally under psychological safety. Mm. And there's a book about him. It's not a memoir. It's a journalist prescriptive called American Icon. Mm. That is phenomenal. Alan Mulally is probably the greatest living CEO, especially mm. of a publicly traded company for sure. Um, and one, we, we need to tell stories more like about mm. Alan and, and Ed and and Sally Krawcheck and all of these other like there's a lot of positive amazing CEOs out there and for some reason it's always the negative stories we're always talking about two tech founders that want to fight each other right now can we can we get back <laughs> to, to talking about these positive servant yeah. leaders that have made such an impact great point you know I, my memory I recall Ford being the one of the big three that didn't take the bailout but I did yep. not realize the close proximity of Mullally's start there and him being largely responsible for them yep. not taking the bailout. Yep. No, that was, that was exactly it. Mullally started in 2006 and they started addressing their problems then. And by the mm-hmm. time the financial crisis hit, they said, well, you know, we already took out the, we, they, they mortgaged the blue oval, right? They took out the largest, they, he, he always calls it the largest mortgage in human history. <laughs> um, they had already started, they reworked their labor contracts. They did everything that the other two were forced to do when they were taking orders from the government because they took the bailout money. They mm-hmm. had already started. Mm. And, um, and, and they did it, by the way, by building that sense of psychological safety, by being willing to finally admit what our problems were. Alan had to get the leadership team to a point where people mm. felt free and respected enough to say, this is going wrong and I need help. And as a result, when the it, what's that Warren Buffett quote, right? When the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. All three of the automakers were swimming naked. Alan Mulally was the one that came in two years earlier and was like, we got to fix this or there's going to be a problem. You know, you mentioned Roger Martin, so I can't let that go without saying that since you've been on the show, we've had Roger on not once, but twice. Oh, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Did he talk about Aristotle? He, he tends to get into his rants about uh, Aristotle. Yes, I think he did, as a matter of fact. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, love it. Yeah. Love it. That's how well I know that man's work. <laughs> Last question for you revolves around this concept called personal knowledge management. You know, you go back to maybe David Allen days and getting things done. And we all, I think, have, a, have an innate understanding of, of what it means to uh, get our tasks and our to-dos out of our head and, mm-hmm. and on paper and how important that is. I think a lot of us miss the mark when it comes to getting our knowledge out of our head. And there's two different things. Tasks and to-dos are one yeah. thing. Knowledge is another thing. 
I'd be curious whether or not you have any sort of tricks or uh, strategies you use on a regular basis for making sure that the the things you learn uh, from others uh, that may end up being you know leveraged, like some of your stories and whatnot in, in future books, how do you make sure that those things that come along don't get lost? What do you do to save them and, and know where to find them when the time comes, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. So I um, I actually, I should probably ask you more about whether or not this is working because you're, you're the expert that teaches people on this, right? So. I, it depends on what I'm reading, right? Mm-hmm. So I will either be reading Kindle, especially if I'm traveling, cause it's just easier, or mm-hmm. I, I still love to hold physical books. If I'm reading a, I have a really weird system. Actually, if I'm reading a physical book, I will read it with the smallest pad of post-it notes you've ever seen. <laughs> and I don't, cause I don't like writing in books. I just, it, it, like a book is a work of art to me. And so it feels like <laughs> defacing them. I know it's supposed to be about note taking, whatever. I don't do that. Here's what I do. Yeah. If there's something on that page that's brilliant, I just put a post-it note kind of, you know, on the page relative to where the sentence that I love is. Mm. And then when I'm done with the book, I will photocopy or scan every page from the book that I liked. Okay. And then I dump that in Evernote. Right mm. now, it's a whole lot easier if I'm reading on Kindle because I've got Kindle to read wise to Evernote so that the highlights just go automatically in there. Mm. Either system's fine. And then when I'm when I'm when it's time to write a book, the first thing I do is go searching through that file, trying to find everything about psychological safety that I've saved over the last couple of years, or you know, mm. oh, I seem to remember a story about this. Uh, and so I go through and search all of that. And then, and this is where I feel embarrassed. Then I print it all out every single one. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll highlight the sentence that I'll write the notes, but I'll write them on the piece of paper, not on the book itself. Right. Mm-hmm. And then when I start writing a book, I just, it's piles of paper. Chapter one is a pile over here. Chapter two is a pile over here and what have mm-hmm. you. And, and I like that system because when I return to the, like my problem with note-taking beyond in a book, beyond the idea that it's a, a work of art is that if it's been five years, I'd prefer to reread that book with a fresh mind than to see my notes. My notes were already captured as in Evernote from the last time I did whatever, but Mm. I'd love to kind of like see that thinker's ideas fresh again. Mm. And I might end up Mm. taking home whole new things if I return to the book. So I don't want the book defaced, right? But I've captured the notes for the specific project. I like that. That's that's a great system. I I, No shame in printing (laughs) printing that stuff out. I mean, I I guess I should say I'm a professional writer. So I already kill a lot of trees anyway (laughs) when we print the book. So, So what's a few thousand more? Well, there's a lot to be said, I think, for, you know, I, I'm a lover of physical books too. That's certainly my preference when I when I read a book. Probably ebooks are, are my least favorite way, though I do mm-hmm. read some books uh, that way. I, there's just something about the spatial aspect of a physical book that yeah. you know, speaks to me that that it's hard to describe. And so that the and that just being this this physical object that I hold makes a difference. And I can see that too with with printing those things out and, and the physicality of those things and, and how, how that, that can make a difference in comprehension perhaps and retention, yeah. maybe those kinds of things. Yeah. No, I think so. I think so. Hey, let me ask you a question actually, because you're the you're the you're the note taking master. You're the expert, right? <laughs> What do you do for podcasts and audiobooks? I've yet to develop, like literally right now, my system is if I listen to a great audiobook, mm-hmm. I buy a physical copy of the book and then do the system I just described again, which I feel like probably wastes time. Do you have a good way mm-hmm. you capture notes, ideas, thoughts, quotes from audiobooks or podcasts or, you know, that type of thing? Uh, for podcasts, especially, I, I think I have something that'll rock your world. I'm not sure I can say the same for audiobooks. Uh, I, I still feel like we're missing, technologically speaking, an easy way to get the things we want to get out of audiobooks into a notes app or other system. As I listen to an audiobook, usually it's because I'm on the go or I'm driving. And so mm-hmm. I've, I've got the 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 drive version of Audible, you know, where it's just the big large buttons, you know, and yep. whenever I hear something that that I want to go back to, I just tap bookmark, bookmark, bookmark along the way. And then that involves in later sitting down and just literally going back through those bookmarks one at a time yeah. and taking yeah. physical notes on those on those bookmarks, handwritten notes that or or typing notes in a notes app. For podcasts, though, um, earlier this year, a new app that uh, was in private beta, and now I think I think it's still in public beta. Uh, it's an app called Snipped, <laughs> not to be confused with that operation that some men have at a certain age. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really bad branding title, but okay, let's keep going. But uh, it's S N I P D, available for Android and iPhone, and so it's a podcast listening app. However. Uh, what it allows you to do in the app is for any podcast episode, press a button and create a transcript in the app for that podcast that you then can follow along, which is important so that when you hear something 
that you want to save, you highlight with your finger in the transcript that part, and it syncs to Readwise, which then syncs it to uh, your, your notes app, okay. uh, along with any notes you write about it, right? Your own personal notes about it. So, that, and, and all that's happening in the background. You're just listening and highlighting passages in the transcript it provides for you, the things you want to remember, and, and adding any notes that, uh, of your own that you want to put in there. And then all that other stuff, as you know, happens in the background. It just yeah. automatically ends up in your notes app. I wish oh, there was good. something similar for Audible or uh, yeah, for, for, for audiobooks. But right now, there's not. If we if we could find a way to create something like that for audiobooks, then we'd have, I think, yeah, everything covered. Yeah, no, I got a, I got a couple contacts at Audible. I'm going to email them and be like, "Who's in charge of buying out competitive <laughs> companies? Because you need to buy this company and just put it into your player." Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Well, the book again is called "Best Team Ever: The Surprising Science of High Performing Teams." I was going to show David all the marks and highlights I had made in the book just to show him, you know, how much I got out of it, but since that's defacing his art, I'm not going to do that. But David, I will say this is a fantastic book. Everybody should pick up. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. You know, I really am all about that Snipped app. If you have not tried it, I strongly recommend it. It's the app I recommend to anyone wanting to listen to podcasts, particularly podcasts you want to grow and learn from. Just search Snipped S-N-I-P-D in your app store to get it. If you'd like to dig into this episode a little bit more, find out more about David, go to the show notes page for this episode. You'll find links to the resources that he and I mentioned. It's all at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 484 for episode 484. And if you haven't yet tried a Read to Lead Plus membership, you can check it out free for two weeks. After that, it's just nine bucks a month by going to jeffbrown.com. Me. Again, you're going to get access to monthly guest expert trainings, a monthly Ask Me Anything, themed challenges, networking opportunities, a chance to be spotlighted within the community, and a free business book summary every single week. Find out more at jeffbrown.me. Next time on the podcast, we'll be welcoming author Brian Orr, who's written a book called Unconformed, an unbound and unbridled path to unstuck growth. Again, that's next time on the Read to Lead podcast. Well, that does it for this week. Hope to see you next time. Until then, as always, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read.